Hi, this is uh, Lori Borman, and I'm here with Dan Ariely to talk about his new book, which um, is uh, has just come out, and it's about dishonesty and how we're all um, lying to everyone, including ourselves. Um, so here's Dan's book. Um, so tell us about um, uh, about why you uh, decided to write this book uh, and how it pr um, relates to the one that you had before it. Yeah, so, so in, in Predictably Irrational, I wrote about small irrational behaviors that people uh, engage in, how we don't know how much to pay for coffee and how we uh, develop habits, uh, how we're influenced by brands, all kinds of things like that. They're really small, interesting uh, behaviors that affect all of us in a very uh, daily and routine way. Um, but the last few years since the financial crisis, and by the way, I had a tremendous privilege that my first book came out exactly when the financial crisis was starting, <laughs> and I think because of that, people were really interested in listening. I think if it came out a year earlier, people said, no, 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 rationality rules. But the moment the financial crisis was coming about, people, I think, were much more open to the idea that we have these biased, systematic irrationalities. But then when I looked at the fiasco in the market, it looked to me like these were just larger scale of the same irrationalities, and particularly it was the problem of conflicts of interest. And think to yourself the following. Imagine that I would pay you $5 million a year if you could only see mortgage-backed securities as a good product. Don't you think you would be able to do it? Mm. And I don't mean that you would lie, that you would say to your clients, oh, these are really great, but deep in your heart you would feel that they are bad. No, wouldn't you actually start believing that they are better? And what if other people around you behave the same way and believe the same way and you had the social proof what other people around you are doing? And what if they were very complex and you were sitting there with a big Excel spreadsheet and you had to figure out what they were worth, but if you were figuring out how high value here in the bottom, your bonus would also uh, increase. And I started thinking about the financial crisis in this way. And then I started thinking about, is it, is it the case that we're getting ourselves into trouble as a society by not understanding this honesty? And initially, I just thought about the markets. In the marketplace, in the financial markets, what you do is you have very fuzzy regulations, and then you would get a big punishment at the end if you don't behave well. But if people don't think about the punishment at the end, are we, are we getting ourselves into trouble? Because people behave based on their momentary incentives, behave very badly, and don't think about the long term. And by the way, the evidence for people not thinking about the long term is really incredible. And, and it, it struck me that as a society we're, cre we're getting this tremendous deterioration of where we are because we don't understand uh, the incentives and we don't understand dishonesty. And I don't mean that people are bad people. Usually you say, oh, bad people lie and good people don't lie. No, no, that's not true. All of us, all of us lie. All of us can lie a little bit. The good news is the good people don't lie a lot. But we <laughs> can lie a little bit. But if it happens a lot to lots of people, the financial devastation is, is incredible. And then as a second step, I looked not just in the financial market, but I looked at all kinds of other behaviors. What happens in our lives? What happened to me as a researcher? What happened to you when you go to your dentist or your doctor? Okay, all of us have these opportunities to see reality in a slightly distorted way, and if we do it, what are the uh, consequences of that? So because of that, I think, uh, for me, it's an ideological book. I want people in banking and finance and medicine to read this book, which I don't know if they would, I'm trying. Um, but I think it's also something that all of us should read because these are things that are affecting our lives. Right? When you go to your financial advisor, you should, be real, you should realize that they have a conflict of interest. And even though they might have kids in the PTA with you and they might have, uh, you, know, the, you might have mutual friends and so on, they don't have to be bad people to give you bad advice. And we created these tremendous structures that gives us just bad advice about life, and we need to know how to deal with it. So, in your experience, then, who might you think is the most dishonest person in the library? In the library? <coughs> well, I think it's a question of how you define dishonesty in a particular case. I tell you, when I talk to my undergrads, uh, almost none of them have no illegal download music on their computers. Mm. So from that perspective, they're all in that category. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about that. First of all, even though, let's say, 99% of the undergrads have illegal download music on their computers, it doesn't mean that necessarily they're immoral in other aspects of their lives. Right? It just means that in that particular aspect, they've taken that, and they've almost taken it out of the moral domain. It's because it's easy, 
It's because they don't see the person suffering. I mean, it's all the things that I describe. Mm -hmm. It says, when are people going to be both immoral but justified to themselves? I recently gave a talk in San Francisco, and I said something about illegal download music and, uh, and rationalization. And one kid said, what do you mean, what do you mean? He said, I have a ton of illegal download music, and I'm actually doing a favor to the artist, because the artists just want their music to be heard, and I hear them, and all the money goes to the big label in the, uh, uh, companies and who cares about them anyway, they're making too much money. So in his mind, he created the world and he, he was actually a fighter for justice mm. by downloading illegal material. I suggested to him that he spends a year, uh, records some music, uh, get it out and get people to just illegally download mm. and ask him how he would feel <laughs> in, that, <laughs> exactly. in that condition. Um, but, uh, but I think illegal downloads are, is a case where there has been a moral deterioration. You know, many years ago, if you caught somebody doing that, they would feel bad about it. Now, they don't even feel bad about it. If, you, if I go to the undergrads and I said, if your name was in the New York Times tomorrow as somebody who had illegal download music on your computer, would your friends think any differently of you? They said, no, I don't care. And this is a case where basically the, there's no morality anymore. Mm. We don't care. There's no shame. There's no internal judge that looks at that. Now, if you came to my house and you saw it, a CD and you took it from my house, now you would feel really bad about that and that's where your morality would stop you from being bad. But in illegal download, there's not like that. So I think that's uh, probably the most typical uh, <coughs> exercise of immorality. I think the second thing, which is a, as a university a library is crucial to me, is what happens with plagiarism. And I think there is a chance that plagiarism is going down the same the same steps. And I think that as we get more online universities where there's not a direct contact and not direct contract between the professor and the, and the student, and as the rules are becoming more fuzzy about what is a real source and what is not a real source, uh, there is a chance that those things would also become. And of course, when other people are doing it as well, there's a chance that we would get to a state where uh, students think about plagiarism as poker rather than as something immoral. Mm. So um, also, I guess, then thinking that people, that personal connection of understanding that someone has um, hurt someone is really... That's right. And so and, maybe... And the opposite is true, too, that the more distant you have from the act, the easier it is to do it and then to justify it. So how might um, librarians help then to keep their collection safe and, and to help keep people more honest in the yeah. library? So, so I think, first of all, there's a question of what do we put in the books? Right? The books are really the um, interface with people who are borrowing them. Right? What, what might you write on a book if you wanted to get people to realize uh, <coughs> what they're doing and it's a public resource? Right? How would you remind them? I mean, somebody might say, oh, you know, the library is, I'm reading the book, nobody else would want to read it. How do you get them to think about the fact that they have a public good, that they're putting trust in something that other people would use later and they should treat it with respect and uh, be nice to other people? That, that would be one thing. Um, so I might, uh, <coughs> but maybe I would change the word from borrow, right? If you borrow a book, it, it means it's in your possession. Maybe you're the custodian. I mean, maybe I would put something like, mm. you know, you're entrusted uh, with this book for a short time, and it's your responsibility to uh, give it back. Uh, m maybe I would do something that uh, indicates the list of people who are interested in reading the book later. Uh, here's all the people who are waiting for the books, and here how long you would have waited in the people in, b before you. I mean, what's really wonderful about libraries is it's really a system of social reciprocation. If everybody behaves badly, the whole system collapses, and we need yes. to all behave well for the benefit of all of us as a group. So I would try to think about how we strengthen that. Every time that I could put something about community, uh, about what you're getting and what you're giving and what your responsibility is, um, there's also something called social proof. Social proof is the idea that we don't know what's the right behavior in many cases. So, for example, in this book on, on cheating, I describe a, a case in which you see other people cheating, and all of a sudden you start cheating to a higher degree. Mm. Uh, with library books, people might not know what's the optimal behavior, what's the common behavior. Uh, how as a librarian would you represent it to them? You could say things like most people, 
do this, or most good citizens do that, or most people in your age group, in your community. Basically, give people a sense of what's a desirable behavior. Okay? What about giving people compliments when they behave way? I mean, I know that we do fines, but fines are actually very tricky. Um, in my first book, I describe uh, some cases in which you give people fines and they behave worse. Uh, this, there's a very famous uh, story about the uh, kindergarten. And the kindergarten parents were late, and they decided to put a fine of $5 a day. And what happened now? The parents were more late. Because if you were late before, you know, and when you got there, the school teacher would look at her watch and would make you feel guilty. No, they just charge you $5 a day. I can be an hour. <coughs> For $5 an hour, I can be three hours late, right? You can have my, my kid if I have a busy day at work. Um, so the fine, I think, is a very strange system for libraries, and I think it takes some, something away from the social responsibility. Now, it's a good way to make money, and I think you can think about what are better ways to get more money from people uh, and not create this clash between the social norm. I should do it because I'm a good person and it's a public good, and I should contribute versus it's just a dollar a day. I can afford it. I'll keep it for another 10 days. Well, those are really good things to think about, and I remember that from your first book of, of that social responsibility, and especially, I guess, in a business situation of being careful of yeah. separating those two. What other tips might you give? Um, it, sorry, could you tell me if you um, can you tell, like, by looking at someone if they're more honest <coughs> than others? Are there are there hints that you give other than these? you know, sort of group activities or knowing? I don't think we know uh, what gets people. First of all, I would say that um, probably the amount of variance explained by the personality is probably lower than the amount of variance explained by the situation. So we need to control the situation to a higher degree. Um, I don't think we can look at somebody and know. Um, so I don't Unless think you're a mentalist. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Even in that case, I don't think they do, no. <laughs> um, What do you want people to take away from your, your book? <coughs> so, so f from this book, uh, I want people to understand, first of all, that dishonesty is an interesting example of an irrational behavior. And to learn that th there is this case, but there are other cases as well, when we think we know how, how we work, but in fact we don't. We work in very, very different ways. That's kind of in a general way. The second thing is I think they need to think differently about dishonesty, both because it's interesting in its own sake and also because it plays to our lives. So when you go to a doctor at some point or a dentist and they recommend a, spe a specific treatment for you, uh, you should really think carefully about their conflicts of interest. And I'm, I don't think you should say these are bad people. We say, even if it's a fantastic doctor, can they see past their conflicts of interest? And I hope that you would come to the conclusion that the answer is no. And if it's a small decision, okay. But if it's a big decision, maybe you want to go and get a second opinion. And maybe you should do the same thing with your dentist and financial advisor and lawyer and all kinds of other cases. And then people should think differently about their own professions. Right? Because, you know, every time that we start behaving badly, there's a risk of a slippery slope. And at some point, we can't stop ourselves anymore. At mm -hmm. some point, people just try to cover their tracks. And we all get to those situations. We get to the situation with the IRS, when people kind of fudge the numbers a little bit, and in romantic relationship, and how we educate our kids, and basically creating very strict rules that don't allow us to make the first step, and then not let, allow us to do the slippery slope, I think is crucial. Great. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. Um, My pleasure. It's, a, it's been uh, a really, really interesting, and we're looking forward to that next book. Take care. Take care.